protesters continued to march and the news revealed growing numbers of idiots on parade. Did you know that the current political leaders of both Gaza and Israel's West Bank, now Palestinian territories, that they were avowed violent, wanted terrorists long before they were the politicians controlling their country? Hamas is a branch of former President Barack Obama's favorite Middle Eastern Islamic organization. Hamas is the Palestinian branch of the Muslim Brotherhood. I was neither rational nor patriotic during the Vietnam era. While many of our friends were carrying guns into rice paddies, some of us were carrying signs into peace rallies. The truth is that a lot of us were just looking for ways to avoid being drafted. That's part of the reason a lot of young men went to college at that time. But attending college was not the only method to avoid the draft. Now, I knew some genuine conscientious objectors. They were called COs. Many of you will remember the slogan, America, love it or leave it. Well, that was often directed at draft dodgers who refused to serve in the military. I have a cousin who was a conscientious objector, legitimately. He acted on his convictions and left America. Others had health problems that became their ticket to freedom from the draft. People with legitimate handicaps or obvious physical impairments were excused from military service and they were issued 4F draft deferments. Boy, were those things welcomed by a lot of folks. <laughs> but for the most part, if you were not in college and you had a pulse, you were qualified for the military draft. The remaining exemptions were obvious, but you may not have thought about them. The military didn't want to babysit strung out drug addicts. They didn't want to pass out automatic weapons to certified crazy people. And they didn't want to enlist queers into the GI population. But like I said, that was back in the 1960s. It was before Don't Ask, Don't Tell. It was before queers had their own lobby in Congress and became highly sought after political advisors or cabinet members of liberal presidents. Bad wars often come from bad politics and bad religion can create bad wars and bad politics. For example, think about Palestinian terrorists. Did you know that the current political leaders of both Gaza and Israel's West Bank, now Palestinian territories, that they were avowed, violent, wanted terrorists long before they were the politicians controlling their country? I hope you remember the Palestine Liberation Organization, the PLO. If so, perhaps the name Black September rings a bell. These were the Palestinian terrorists who slaughtered the Israeli athletes at the Munich Olympics. The PLO group also assassinated the Jordanian Prime Minister. They famously hijacked passenger jetliners and slaughtered passengers. Did you know they murdered U.S. ambassadors and bombed synagogues? They actually hijacked a luxury cruise ship. Think about that the next time you book a cruise vacation. At that time, only Jewish passengers were killed, but that was long ago. Palestinians now kill Christians, atheists, Jews, even other Muslims. The PLO changed their name to the Palestinian Authority, and they became the politicians who now control Israel's West Bank. They are the official funnel for the billions of dollars sent as foreign aid to that wing of Palestinian terrorists. But another brand of Muslim terrorists took control of Gaza when Israel agreed to the world's demands of land for peace. Israel gave up all 100% of the land of Gaza, 
but Israel only got massacres instead of peace. Hamas received billions of dollars of aid for Gaza. Uh, by the way, Hamas is a branch of former President Barack Obama's favorite Middle Eastern Islamic organization. Hamas is the Palestinian branch of the Muslim Brotherhood. You may remember that the Brotherhood won Obama's widely touted support during the Arab Spring when Egypt went off the rails. Make no mistake, both groups of Palestinians celebrate when Americans or Israelis are murdered. But Democrats keep sending them money and college morons keep demanding we support these terrorists. Of course, when Israel was forced to root out Hamas in Gaza, it was quickly identified where the billions in foreign aid dollars went. The Palestinians built hundreds of miles of underground terrorist tunnels filled with vast armaments of guns, rockets, missiles, and explosives. Hamas stripped the Palestinian national economy to invest in terrorism. They intentionally kept their people impoverished, and then they used them as human shields to continue their war on Israeli civilians. By any definition, this was textbook bad religion, bad wars, and bad politics. Only brainwashed college liberals and progressive pro-Palestinian democratic congressional leaders could support such a travesty. Yet the protesters continued to march and the news revealed growing numbers of idiots on parade. I do apologize. Not for the idiots on parade description. I, I couldn't think of any more appropriate description of college-educated anti-Semitic protesters. But perhaps I shouldn't have used that archaic term queer earlier. Forgive me if that offended anyone with the nomenclature common in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. I assume even today that is what their own preferred abbreviation stands for when used within LGBTQ, etc., etc., etc. Try not to hate me. Remember, I'm just sharing some history here. And for the record, I do not think being queer is a worse sin than being an adulterer or a fornicator. God lumps it all together. I, I recognize that in earlier decades, queers were usually considered more deviant than other perverts. But that just meant that their perversions were different than our own. In simple, honest terms, the church wasn't liberated enough to tolerate homosexuals. We preferred regular fornicators and adulterers because we have often seen them in the mirror. I guess adulterers don't seem quite as disgusting as gays. Somehow it seems the church is oddly understanding of some damnable sexual sins while we are repulsed by other equally damnable sexual sins. And some denominations are far more tolerant than God. They welcome gays as members, pastors, and even bishops in spite of the fact that God condemns all forms of sexual sin. Of course, I don't want anyone to lose sight of the fact that regardless of the depth of our degradation, God's love still outweighs any wrong done when we come to Him on His terms. But allow me to return to the methods for legally dodging the draft Falsifying one's sexual preferences was not a politically correct alternative. It would have been effective, but most of us would have sooner been tortured in the Hanoi Hilton than to have been thought to have been a bona fide pink panther, or as the Bible calls them, sodomites and effeminate abusers of themselves with mankind. I guess things have really changed a lot since folks believed the Bible. Now, 
Politicians woo the gay community as a voting constituency instead of social misfits. Obviously, King David would never get reelected today. He ran the homosexuals out of his country altogether. The Bible says he took away the sodomites out of the land. Of course, like I said, things are really different today. Now, it seems no aberrant behavior is really aberrant unless you are a Christian fundamentalist. The rest of America just enjoys what are called alternative lifestyles. Let me just say that drug addicts, queers, crazy people, and college students were reasonably safe from the draft. They may have suffered other consequences due to their behavior, but in general, those conditions got them out of duty in Vietnam. Now, can anyone tell me if there was any real purpose for American troops to be in Vietnam in the first place? I mean, what were we thinking? What, what happened? Did anyone win? The South Vietnamese fight for freedom ended. They lost, we lost, North Vietnam took over and built a successful, though dictatorial, capitalistic financial engine and tourist industry. Communism was ultimately successful in its battle for portions of Southeast Asia. Yet looking across Russia and Eastern Europe, communism certainly didn't win the war. In fact, I don't know, the war seems to engage a much bigger map than is often revealed. I admittedly don't understand God's game plan about these wars, but it causes me to ask some serious questions such as, does communist China have a more significant impact in the Far East as a result of America's failure in Vietnam? Is communist China going to play a greater role in God's end time scenario than some might expect? It seems to me that the communists have outcapitalisted the capitalists. I mean, let's face it, nobody does old school capitalism better than the commies. It's easy when you can use slave labor, there are no pesky business ethics to hinder your financial dominance, and you're chartered to win at any cost because nobody can stop you when you're a communist dictator in a world of spineless democratic leaders. So, as is now well known, China is America's biggest enemy, politically, industrial, economically, militarily, and spiritually. But as the TV infomercial huckster always tells us, wait, there's more. I must ask, what of Russia? Was the apparent failure of Soviet communism a permanent and true defeat? Or will Mother Russia regain momentum before the end of this great conflict between freedom and bondage? It seems clear to many of us that Russia wants to rebuild the former Soviet Union, one piece of Ukraine or Eastern Europe at a time. I, I am not a political commentator, and neither am I an expert on interpreting the future fulfillments of past prophecies, but I do have a pretty good handle on the character of God and his involvement in the history of man. I also have some strong views on how the Word of God influenced the ancient world and the manner in which I believe it is intended to impact modern man. As it relates to war in general, I must ask this probing question. Does God get involved with wars? My answer is very simple, yes. If any soldier is praying, I guess God is involved. However, the God of the Bible is involved far beyond our prayers. The Bible is clear. It says the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. I referenced this verse because it seems to fly in the face of commonly held views about God. Religious folk and peaceniks often assume that our God is a God of peace and he's opposed to war. It seems apparent that this is the view with which we feel most comfortable. This is the kind of God that most people want to believe in. But sadly, 
This is a view of God that runs contrary to the God of the Bible. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Now, don't get flustered and don't get mad at me or mad at God. I think God hates war, just as he hates sin. And yet, God made allowances for both. And in his plan to redeem mankind, God sent Jesus Christ to die for the sins of fallen men and women. The atonement at Calvary is an obvious solution to the sin problem in God's plan. But what of war? What can God possibly do with war? Well, that which the enemy means for evil, God can turn to good. We all see bad religions, bad politics, and bad wars. I want to make sure we also recognize that in spite of all those dangerous and tragic realities, we can know a good God. Yes, the Lord is a man of war, exactly as Moses declared in Exodus. But why did Moses choose this description? I think it was because Moses watched God use the battlefield as a seminary for all who would study the cause and effects of sin. You see, in the final analysis, the Red Sea presented both God's redeeming power to deliver His people and a watery grave to judge His enemies and the military powers that pursued His children. In the same day that the children of Israel rejoiced in the miraculous deliverance of God, the children of Egypt grieved the loss of their fathers who perished in the equally miraculous judgment of God who is a man of war. Certain elements of human history can be reduced to the ebb and flow of redemption and judgment. You see, as the Jerusalem Bible states so poetically, the hand that hurts is the hand that heals. God does both. I believe that there are only two reasons that anything happens to a child of God. Everything that happens in my life is for my ultimate good and God's ultimate glory. Now, sometimes it hurts, but trusting God through the pain can become a glorious event. That is why we're called to rejoice in everything and in everything count it all joy. Everything experienced by a child of God can be used of God in the redemptive process within each life. Then, even our most difficult circumstances can lead to our good and God's glory. Even war has redeeming value when understood in these terms. In the king's English, Job said, He maketh sore and he bindeth up. He woundeth and his hands make whole. In fact, Job suggests happy is the man whom God correcteth. Therefore despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty. Yes, the hand that hurts is the hand that heals. God directs and blesses with both war and peace as he deems best. Perhaps it's like an old country song suggested. Sometimes you're the windshield, sometimes you're the bug. But don't misunderstand. God is not capricious or arbitrary. He judges sin and He blesses obedience. Sometimes war is a result of judgment. And at other times, it might be the tool of God's deliverance. He exercised both responses as He deemed purposeful. Sometimes He harshly judged the disobedience of His children with enemy armies and horrific enslavement. Hence, the biblical accounts of both the Assyrian and Babylonian invasions. And we must never forget the later Roman invasion of Israel. But with the pain of judgment, God also reminded of the joy promised in His deliverance. He that scattered Israel will gather him 
as a shepherd doth his flock. This was God's promise to his people, announcing that he would yet redeem. He would comfort like a good shepherd. However, we cannot lose sight of Jeremiah's overall message. He warned that impending judgment was coming. In fact, the Lord, as a man of war, was preparing to send one of the worst enemy armies that ever fielded troops. He sent these pagan forces to destroy Israel, to capture, kill, and torment the Jewish people. Then the enemy had instructions from on high to drag my people off to live in chains under the bondage of the Babylonian captivity where we endured more slavery for 70 years. But Job was also correct. The hand that hurts is the hand that heals. This was not an isolated promise of God from Job or Jeremiah. An even earlier Jewish prophet revealed God's character equally well. Hosea declared, Come, let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. I must repeat it again, because I serve a sovereign Lord, and his actions are often misunderstood. My God reigns in the affairs of man, and he does all things well. Sometimes correction is needed. At other times, the deepest need of our soul is protection and grace. It's usually not our temporary comfort that interests God. It is our long-term good and the establishment of the eternal plan of God in our lives that moves the cause and effect patterns that direct our lives. God intends to build our lives and our character through our experiences. You see, God is always more interested in our character than our comfort. And in all things, God is faithful. The hand that hurts is the hand that heals. In the case of Hosea, he had caustically warned the northern kingdom of Israel that their oppressive behavior, their lack of compassion for the poor, their ongoing sinful behavior was bringing the judgment of God on their nation. God brought another pagan army to do his bidding and to judge our disobedience. In fact, the prophet Hosea was quite specific. He exhorted my people saying, because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land, by swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery. Look at Iran. Evil exists in the world. Look around. There are bad religions and bad wars, but we know a good God. Do you realize that a Christian revival is taking place in Iran, where Christians are hated, persecuted, and martyred? Have you considered that God may be orchestrating one last chance to allow the message of Christ to cut through the darkened veil of Islam in that region? What, what of the modern Iraqi people, the Saudis, the suffering innocent people of Gaza, don't they all deserve a measure of compassion? I believe God loves Muslims and wants to give them a chance to hear the gospel too. Listen to me, friends. I'm certain that many believing Christians inhabit the ranks of the American and allied troops who serve in the Middle East and who are stationed around the world right now. Even in Israel, Many young Messianic Jewish Christians are serving in the IDF. Do you think some of them will share their faith? I do. I know they are. It's inevitable. But consider the words of Hosea one more time. Do you see that his prophetic words might also speak to you and to me and to our leaders in America? to the people of our land. We are not free from bad religion, 
bad wars or bad politics. Turn on the television, visit a movie theater. We're a nation prone to what Hosea described as swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery. Personally, I believe that judgment is inevitable because as the scripture says, there is no truth nor mercy nor knowledge of God in the land. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but there's a deluge of wickedness covering much of this fallen world, and it covers much of America too. Yes, the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. But war is only one of the judgments of God that is evident and will wash our planet in blood. Allow me to remind you that whatever the consequences of man's bloodshed, there is a fountain flowing deep and wide. It originates at the cross. So never forget that he sent his only begotten son to die for us. Yeshua HaMashiach is real. Jesus is Lord. And he was such a nice Jewish boy. I would certainly enjoy hearing your comments. Please drop me a line at Crosstalk. P.O. Box 2528, Cedar Hill, Texas. 75106 USA. Of course, you can visit our website at crosstalk.org. I read all of my emails and each of the letters you mail me. In any case, do contact me and let me know your thoughts about this series. I also hope you will come back for our next episode of Crosstalk. My name is Randy Weiss. Till next time, Shalom.